Hello everyone and welcome back to our course, our course on commercial open source startups. We are now uh, starting the third lecture in the middle part uh, about commercial open source. In the previous two lectures we talked about open source software and open source processes and community projects. Now we're switching gears and we will be looking at the commercialization or the commercial strategies around open source. For that, we will look at three main business models, two of them in more detail. So commercial open source uh, software is first of all open source software, but then it is software that is being developed in a particular way, which is to say not as community open source software, but rather for commercial purposes. Uh, by one or more software vendors. And the key here is that these software vendors uh, structure the development and what they make available in such a way that it supports their business and the revenues they want to derive of a complementary product. That is the key to understand. There is no open source product in itself. Open source is always free. The product will be something complementary, but it is enriched by some open source software that is part of it. So the product is never free. The open source software is, but the product is something complementary. We still call it commercial open source or even sometimes open source business model because it builds on open source, but it is not open source. Why would you even follow a commercial open source strategy? Well, as will become apparent in this lecture, the idea is to drive adoption of something, the open source software, in its market in such a way that the ubiquitous presence of your open source software is a perfect path to innovation, but more importantly, sales of your complementary or the product you build on the open source software. So you open source something that's valuable to users to build a large user base that is just users, not customers, they're not paying, but user base from which uh, benefits accrue. That can be the bug reports, even possibly sometimes bug fixes, though in general it's just information. But ultimately, your goal will be to convert some, not all, that's not possible, but some of these users to paying customers. You also do it in such a way that competitors can't build on your product or on your open source software to compete with you. And we will have to look at how to do that. What's not new here is the revenue sources, uh, what customers will ultimately pay for. The software industry long figured that out. And because <laughs> that's the key thing to figure out, what is it that customers pay for? So that's well understood and doesn't change. Pretty much all other business functions are affected though by you open sourcing parts or all of your uh, software. Here are a couple of examples of companies that you would call commercial open source firms. There's the original MySQL database uh, now owned by Oracle. Uh, there are the uh, open source distributors like Red Hat and SUSE. Uh, there are some less well-known ones now defunct or acquired like Pentaho or MuleSoft and some upstarts like ArangoDB and YugabyteDB. These uh, commercial open source firms behind these open source projects are doing pretty well. Many of them are unicorns and in this uh, table by OSS Cash you can see the exit and ultimately the wealth creation uh, for at least the shareholders of these uh, companies which had an open source or still have an open source strategy. The term open source, commercial open source originated in 2004, 2005 because until then there was open source software but businesses were always worried about, can I use open source software? Uh, what happens if something goes wrong with the software? And hence, at the time, 
uh, Sugar CRM, one of the early commercial open source firms, actually coined that term commercial open source to indicate to users, to businesses, that this is valid software, that it's supported by companies, and that you can use and later buy uh, licenses to use the software without problems. It's just good business. Now, when you look at the structure of what it is that um, companies, software vendors sell, our initial model from the first part of this course, you may remember core, basic and whole product. And here, the open source part is always part of the core product. It becomes the key software in there. Uh, and that's the only thing that's open source. Um, there may be added functionality, or either it's part of the core software, or if it's not, then it's usually to pay for added functionality. There may be uh, complementary artifacts or complementary services, self-help services that may be provided for free and maybe you, sometimes you have to pay for it. Everything beyond that, the basic product, uh, any guarantees you provide, any certification, uh, any training, consulting, or certainly any operations of the software in the cloud for customers, that is always commercial, that is always to pay for. So we can already see how there is a complementarity between something that is open source software, just the software, and then things around it, things that enhance some core piece of software, turn it into a basic, turn it into a whole product that will be commercial. So here you can see uh, the structure of an open source product of now acquired by TIPCO, uh, Jaspersoft, uh, a provider of business intelligence uh, uh, software. And they both had a library for use in other products that they sold as well as a standalone BI tool by which so BI lets you uh, analyze your business data, drill down, roll up. That's what it called, for example, over sales territories to see on the one hand aggregates like total sales worldwide and on the other hand details, sales in the city of Erlangen, for example. And um, uh, Jaspersoft had two uh, main sales channels. One was a web store and one, one was a direct sales force. So first of all, Jaspersoft was commercial open source. So they made a core part of the product available as open source software and users used it and they did not pay. They were just users. However, uh, some t not everything was made freely available. Some documentation, some training, some added functionality was not open source, was not free. And if you were a user of the open source software, then that documentation and that incident based support could be uh, acquired through the web store of the company. So you really go to the store, web store and buy the documentation and pay for it. Incident based support is support where you pay for the case, the incident, rather than for their availability nine by five or 24 seven. Um, that is somewhat unusual. Most commercial open source uh, startups don't actually have a web store, don't have this small coin type of uh, revenue streams. The relevant revenue streams and also in the case of Jasper, 90-95% of the revenues came from direct sales of a more complete whole product to enterprise customers or to OEMs. Enterprise customers were those customers who would use the BI application as a whole and the OEMs would be those who only paid for the library and embedded it in their own products. That's why for these two variants of more or less the same product, uh, you had two different licenses. Enterprise customers had a classic, this is pre-cloud days, had a classic license um, had a classic license uh, subscription with initial license fee and maintenance revenue, but the OEMs always had to buy a perpetual license because their uh, 
they didn't want the license to terminate while their own product was still in use with their customers. So you can see the components of, uh, of what is being sold, uh, a license to use, uh, access to the update service, utilities, so added functionality, documentation training, different support levels and so forth. So the key thing to take away here is no, nothing surprising. Uh, all software vendors, enterprise software vendors in some form or another sell this. And you don't even see open source specifically here. Um, the license that is being sold, for example, is actually a commercial license to the very code that is also available under an open source license. If that is confusing, uh, it shouldn't be because it is possible if you are the copyright holder to license out your property under multiple licenses, one being the open source and open source license and another one being the uh, commercial license. So again, if the revenue streams, what is being sold, what customers pay for isn't so surprising. Um, how do you, uh, uh, w w what's so novel about uh, open source? So we already said that uh, first of all, to be clear in our minds, we need to distinguish between community open source, where there is a broad array of stakeholders who all share in the ownership, and then commercial open source, where there is unique intellectual property owned by the vendor and the vendor only. And that is, of course, ultimately what the, they derive or their revenues from a word goes back to then, of course, with additional layers on top. There are three forms of commercial open source firms. There are the single vendor open source firms, which we will discuss in detail. Then there are the open source distributor firms, which we will also discuss. And then there are service and support firms, which are really just consultancies, which we will only shortly touch on. The key here and the dominance is in the single vendor open source firms and uh, uh, to some extent in the distributors. The difference is single vendor open source is usually just uh, some application or some component, while a distributor, an open source distribution, you only get that if you are covering something of the size of an operating system. And so it's much less common uh, to build a distribution than just a regular open source application. So common to both single vendor open source firms and open source distributors is that uh, they can make a lot of money. They attract venture capital. The single vendor open source firm uses it to develop a product, just like any regular closed source enterprise, but then open sources uh, some or all of it and builds their business on it. Uh, the purpose of open sourcing is as already touched upon to drive adoption of the bare bones product in the market and then to upsell customers to the commercial version. The open source distributor has a somewhat different IP strategy, as we will discuss later again. They don't necessarily, they usually don't own the IP of the components that constitute the distribution, but they do own the IP of what's in between. So an open source distribution is an assembly of a large, typically assembly of open source components configured well to work with each other. That's the challenge of a distribution, not the individual components, but making a large array of components work together well. And so what they own and don't make freely available is the knowledge of what's in between the components, the configuration, the test suites, the compatibility matrices, and so forth. And finally, there are the service and support firms, which uh, offer you services around usually community open source uh, software. They don't own the IP, but because, that they're, because their business is based on it, they probably share in the IP and uh, own some of the IP, and that's how they position themselves in the market. For example, they contribute to GCC, and hence they are a go-to party if a company wants support for GCC. Because they are service and support firms, consulting firms, they mostly scale with labor, and they generally do not attract venture capital. Their growth is 
somewhat limited compared to classic vendors. Now, for these, and certainly for the single vendor open source firm and open source distributors, uh, the main challenge is if somehow your core product is available or core pieces of your software are available as open source and many users are happy just to use the open source software, still, how do you maximize the conversion of those who are non-paying users to paying customers? How do you get customers? How do you sell? At the same time, some of the benefits of going the open source route is that you get that user community which is much larger than any paying customer community and as a consequence you get some benefits from that but what are they and how to get them and finally if you are contributing or even leading or doing 100 percent of the development of the software that is open source how do you prevent that your customers uh, yeah, that your competitors pick up uh, the software and compete with you. Right? So you are doing the development, you're incurring the cost, and now your competitors are just using the same software to provide the service you're also providing. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see how that goes. Um, and then how do you prevent that or how do you deal with that? Because uh, you don't want such competition usually. Now then, on to the first and uh, to the dominant model in the industry, the so-called single vendor open source firms. Uh, single vendor open source software is commercial open source software where there is exactly one vendor behind it. So the software is developed by that one vendor, the software, uh, the roadmap is managed by that one vendor and that one vendor only. And then the single vendor open source software firm is that said single vendor, that software vendor that manages this type of software. So they position themselves, they manage the trademarks, they are often synonymous with the software. For example, MySQL, the database, was developed by MySQL AB, meaning a company of same name. So that is key then to understand single vendor open source the intellectual property is owned by that single vendor and they do not share, they do not allow broad participation in the IP. So single vendor open source firms, they own all the control mechanisms. In particular, that's the copyright to the software, maybe patents in there, certainly any trademarks around the software and associated with that, since they are the one to start it all, they will most likely also own all the relevant domains and communication channels that tie to the name of the open source software. And uh, as has been shown time and time again, they can make as much money as traditional closed source vendor and hence they attract venture capital and so forth. Now, think back to the definition of open source. There's the legal definition. It's open source software if there's an open source license uh, attached to it. And the process definition, it's open source software by process if a broad array of community members participate and join in the development. So if open source was defined purely by legal terms, then the software made available by a single vendor open source firm is actually open source. However, they do not allow for an open participatory, open collaboration uh, community process like community open source. That's why it's called commercial open source. So commercial open source here, certainly single vendor open source, is in legal terms open source software, but not in process terms. And hence, there's actually in the industry a little bit of a fight over what actually now is the open source definition, just the legal one or the process one included. Realistically, what it means is that single vendor for open source firm really controls the software. And maybe they should not be called open source firms, but rather neo proprietary firms because 
this firm is the proprietor of the software. So here are three generations. That's my current observation of what happened in the markets over the in the market over the last thirty years or so. They were the pioneers in the nineties uh, of the last uh, century, and so MySQL certainly, but others now maybe less well known. Sleepy Cat, Trolltech, Trolltech with Qt, Spilt, some may know, and so forth. They just they were trailblazers. They found their way individually that all of this was really new. Then came the second wave when venture capitalists and entrepreneurs recognized going an open source route, going a commercial open source route, allowed them to disrupt existing enterprise software markets. Uh, Sugar CRM was one of the first. They coined the term commercial open source as noticed, but there were many others. In fact, the venture capitalists looked at enterprise software markets looked at where were there incumbents that were ripe for disruption and then started or motivated entrepreneurs to start enterprise software companies uh, that took an open source approach to the market to compete with the incumbents and unseat them. So that's the second wave more of the Nordies and basically here uh, this was still pre-cloud classic enterprise sales, the license fee and maintenance revenue, but only after usually the user, the later customer had been a user of the open source version. And we will look at these upsell and sales processes a bit later. So that was the second wave um, uh, until the cloud arrived. And so the cloud started taking more specific forms, maybe after the last recession, 2008, 2009, and some well-known names of companies that are single vendor open source firms took a commercial open source route here, but where the main product is in the cloud are Mongo, MongoDB, Confluent, Redis Labs. And not surprisingly, it's always the company name like the product name very close to each other. Um, this first and second generation, not just the three I just showed, many others, and some of them are still around. Um, the cloud hasn't eaten any, everything yet. Um, but uh, when you look at it, it's a lot of applications. So actually, they were aiming for customers who would be users of software, all right, um, end users, if you will. It's enterprise software for CRM, it's enterprise software for BI, it's enterprise software for your website, content management, enterprise software for your ERP system mostly, and so forth. And the current third generation, interestingly enough, um, is more component oriented. So these are uh, software vendors who go to market and where their product is a software component for other companies who develop software using these components. And then the components are in the cloud. So it's databases a lot, uh, coordination. There is some applications like here, like GitLab, but again, a lot of databases, a lot of AI, a lot of search, which is usually not a standalone application, but rather uh, something you embed in your own products. When you look at the single vendor open source firms, I already implied that there's on the one hand the open source software and on the, on the other hand somehow a commercial product that builds on it or relates to it. Here you can see it out, here you can see it spelled out in more detail. Um, the terminology that the uh, that the commercial community uses here is community edition for what's freely available and commercial edition or enterprise edition variants of that for what the commercial product is. So the community edition is what's free. It's the core open source software and maybe some additional forums to use for free. But the commercial edition uses that same software now licensed under a commercial license, usually with additional functionality that's not in the open source software, 
and then all the trappings that make a real enterprise uh, software product. All the fitness and warranties and guarantees and certification, training, consulting, support, and so forth. And then the uh, key becomes uh, for the company that wants to generate revenues, how do you turn those who are using the community edition into those who are you start to use the commercial edition, meaning become paying users. And when you look at your community, then as a commercial open source vendor, as a single vendor open source firm, you need to realize there are some who will never buy pay. That's certainly true if in your community are consumers or private people. Individual, natural people often are willing to spend their time to figure out things rather than pay for something. And that's very different from business users who have a much more rational view of time. They are much more willing to pay for, um, for services or on products if it saves them time and lets them focus on uh, generating their own revenue. So the line of business users or the business users, users are those who um, you're likely to get to upgrade, to become regular enterprise customers um, of your product. You have to sell to also the line of business or the IT department and uh, both are potential customers for the single vendor open source firm. Now, again, you might ask, uh, uh, how big is the gap really between the open source and what uh, and the commercial version? Because if it's just a small gap, wouldn't it be cheaper if the company spent some time understanding the software and then operate the open source software themselves? Well, uh, that gap, of course, is what the commercial open source firm wants to widen and will widen over time so that there's ever more incentive to go from freeloading user to paying customer. And in order to do that, they really need to own and know how to manage the IP of their product. So even though they make their software available as open source, Therefore, they will not randomly accept contributions from the community. It is not a correct belief to assume that the product is developed by a community. In the case of commercial open source, the product is developed by the company. And if someone from the community of users, freeloading users, comes and wants to make a contribution, then the company will require a sign over of the rights to that contribution so that their stake in the IP does not get diluted. The company wants to own 100% of the critical IP. And so for that they use a contributor assignment so that uh, uh, users who want to contribute uh, hand over, sign over the rights to the company. Because software developers don't like to do that, uh, commercial open source firms get much less contributions than, say, a community open source project. No surprises here. Occasionally, there are important open source projects that, did, that were not started by a company for commercial purposes, but that were so good and became so prominent that companies started building uh, products on top of it. So arguably the core of these products is not, um, is not um, commercial open source, but actually originally community open source. And if it's under a permissive license, so it's a big no-go if it was under a copyleft license, but if it's under uh, under a uh, um, permissive license and it is so important then the situation could happen that you have more than one vendor who decides to build a product on top of it you then have multiple layers you have really have a community open source at the heart and then layers of, co of commercial open source around it that extend the community the community open source for certain users and so forth uh, all these situations 
uh, at least those listed here, commonly take a path where it's the original developers of the community open source software who form that company. Because at that point where they form the commercial open source firm to commercialize the community open source project, copyright is already widely shared. Um, they can't 100% turn it into commercial open source. And in fact, often there are multiple contributors or committers in the community open source project and they found different companies. That's why you get the multi-vendor situation. They worked together well on the community open source project. They saw the chance for commercialization and they split up in different companies. Um, they still are working on the community open source, but they are also extending it with closed source commercial open source, with, clo with commercial open source and ultimately also closed code. And that's what they built their companies on. Over time, they all tend to consolidate. Of the examples you see here, uh, for Hadoop, I think there's only Cloudera left. For Kafka, there is Confluence. Instacluster is still there, but it's much broader. Uh, so it's not just Kafka-based. Uh, um, and for Lucene Solar, there's Elastic, of course, Elasticsearch. And I think Lucidworks and SwiftType are gone, or have been acquired by Elastic. But in general, it's a single vendor, not multiple. On to the second uh, model. So while we just talked about single vendor open source, where a firm develops some novel piece of open source, some novel piece of software, and then goes to market by open sourcing it, an open source distribution is something different. It is a well-integrated collection or aggregation of existing open source components and applications into a cohesive whole. Uh, so the prime example, of course, is uh, Linux. The Linux operating system, not just the kernel, but the kernel plus all the tools, configured in such a way that it works without a hiccup. And so Red Hat uh, and SUSE and Ubuntu are examples of distributions here. Also community distributions like uh, Debian, for example. Um, a distributive firm then is a company which creates such a distribution and sells it to customers as a product. Usually what they sell is a, uh, an update service or well, they, they sell uh, indeed the software, a license to use the software where the license can't be about the individual open source components that's already regulated by the open source licenses but by the way how they configure it how they planted their trademark in there and so forth and um, the ip that they own as mentioned before is uh, all the uh, configuration information of how to make these in the case of linux thousands of components work together well Anyone who has ever had to configure a complex system knows how easy it is to shoot yourself in the foot and configure something that breaks something else. So there's substantial knowledge necessary to configure something well, and that constitutes protectable intellectual property. So the complexity of a distribution that makes life hard if you want to create it from scratch is the number of components, uh, the individual complexity of a component, how many parameters to configure it are there, how they interact, and of course also tracking changes and making all of this work over time. And that's exactly what a distributor hides from its customers, um, how to manage this complexity, how to make the software look, appear like it's seamlessly working, high quality software, without a hiccup. And the common examples are the Linux examples, which I'm sure you know, SUSE, Canonical, for Ubuntu, Red Hat, and so forth. There are actually a lot of, lot, many more. There are lots of niche open source distributors. For example, Univention is a German Linux distributor focusing on, the, on public agencies, uh, bureaucracies, ministries, and so forth. So they just have a niche uh, and are more focused. 
Uh, Kubernetes is right now the other big one because uh, in Kubernetes you have a hundred tiles in that landscape if you've ever seen it and uh, if you want to just these hundred components make them work well you don't but even 10 20 components already making them work together well is quite challenging so there are lots of contenders lots of companies who are selling you a subscription to their Kubernetes uh, distribution there are upstarts, uh, Kubernetes, D2IQ, the original Mesos, um, Rancher, and so forth. Uh, Red Hat OpenShift is uh, a Kubernetes distribution by Red Hat and Rancher, I think, now by SUSE. So the existing Linux distributors also go into Kubernetes, which makes sense because the skills to build a Linux distribution are similar to the skills to build a Kubernetes distribution. It's in the distribution part, not which components it is. It is how to learn and manage these dependencies and configuration schemes and the compatibility matrix and so forth, how to certify that for hardware, etc. Beyond these two big ones, uh, there are a couple more, but there's also lots of small ones. Um, I really, having in the past used the uh, Eclipse Java IDE a lot, I already had a non-working setup with Eclipse after only two or three plugins that I loaded and it stopped working well. Configuration can be such a nightmare that it's even possible that at some point of time Easy Eclipse sold you a nice, nicely configured Eclipse IDE with a hundred plugins for Java Enterprise, JEE and so forth. So. Configuration complexity is a serious problem that these distributors are solving for you for pay. Um, the distributors have less of a community edition these days. Um, Red Hat just, just more or less killed CentOS. Uh, Fedora is still around. SUSE has opened SUSE. The interesting part is these are not simpler versions of their commercial product. These are simply different distribution. I think in Univention and Canonical, their product is actually the community version or community edition of their software plus some then. So Ubuntu is actually Ubuntu, both commercially and in the community edition and Univention corporate server is the same. But for Red Hat and SUSE, that is not, it's not that the commercial edition is an extension of the community edition. And what is key here is that these distributors can't suddenly own again the components. They don't, they still provide those under the open source licenses, but whatever is in between. Um, the configuration data, that's what they can protect, sometimes do protect. Sometimes it's good enough for them that they're the only ones who can efficiently generate them and release new versions. So for that, for the aggregate, then there's a commercial license. So again, the distributors don't exclusively own the code, uh, many more do, and they all can participate, but they do own uh, the build processes, the configurations for that, the compatibility matrices and associated configuration data, knowledge databases for support, regression tests, test suites, um, how to certify or how to get certified for a certain hardware or certain processes that customers need and so forth. So simplifying distributors exclusively own their version of what's in between the open source components. And sometimes that really is in the heads of the people, though of course a good distributor will try to get this out of the heads of people and formalized. Now then, after the two big models, single vendor open source firms, of which there are many, because they are like the traditional closed source vendors, and then the distributor firms, of which there are much less, because they really always cover a whole layer of the technology stack. So they are on the size of an operating system. 
uh, and consequently there are less of it. Uh, we are on to the third model now, service and support firms, which are really just consultancies. So I explained in past lectures the dynamics of consultancies. It is really, it scales with labor. It's a good business to be in if you like this type of work. And um, in order to drum up projects, in order to drum up support customers, you need to usually work on the open source project you're supporting because otherwise you're not believable in terms of can you actually properly support the software. So you do that for marketing and sales purposes and also to maintain your ability and capabilities. And that's it. Um, you get paid for your labor and you won't get venture capital funding. It's kind of straightforward to found such a business. Now, I pointed to how open sourcing is a strategy of acquiring customers, how um, it can be innovative, innovation strategy, how while not a lot, you even can get the community to do some work for you. So now let's look at how these, ben how these benefits or these suggested benefits actually manifest themselves. In overview, uh, if your software is out there as open source software and it's good quality software, so that must, that must be given, must be a given, well, then you can build a reputation for being quality software. Um, faster, cheaper, uh, more broadly, because you have many more users than a closed source software uh, who talk about your uh, work. Hopefully they'll talk about it nicely and so forth. Um, in sales, you always ha already have a foot in the door of a potential customer if they are using your product in-house. In business development, uh, you can see who's interested. You can see much more broadly through a large community. Uh, how your product gets combined with other products, giving you leads or ideas for strategic partnering. In product management, you also see what users are doing, how they're enhancing your product and so forth, giving you ideas for new requirements or features that you might want to provide because apparently some people want it and maybe that's good enough for the product manager to go that way. Um, Software development, the engineering department gets bug reports, many more. So you mature your project uh, product faster. And of course, um, some of the support is handled, has to be handled by the user community because otherwise you would actually have to do more support than rather than less. But we will talk about community management and that in a second. So as explained, uh, Marketing is improved because you have happy users, hopefully, who evangelize, help evangelize your great piece of software uh, that does so well for them and is free above all. And so that sales funnel is already primed for free by users who reach out and talk about your, uh, your product. Of course, you can empower that even more by holding user conferences, by rewarding people who do your work in forums around the world, um, by talking about your product, by giving them t-shirts, what have you. Uh, so there are many ways of uh, stoking the fire here and getting that marketing uh, expanded uh, even further. Beyond that, you already have a large number of users, much more than you would have customers who could do the same otherwise. Sales is perhaps the most convincing argument to some at least. And so I want to look at that into a little bit more detail. Um, here you can see in the top three uh, circles, the classic sales process. You market your product, you have that funnel, and at some point of time you engage in competitive sales because the competitors are also trying to sell uh, to your potential customer and hopefully you win at the end. Now, in that competitive sales situation, you may have to um, create prototypes for your, um, for your customer, for your potential customer, so they can see it work and whether that's a good decision. 
there's a whole boatload of complexity in that sales funnel. If there's an alternative route by way of commercial open source, what can happen and should happen is that before your customers even know they want a product like yours, um, you provide your product as open source, that's a commercial open source strategy, but said company or line of business users in these companies start using your software because they have a need. There are lots and lots of line of business users who see some market opportunity in their own business, need software to support it, and nothing is better in that case than having zero euro line items in the bill of materials of the software components you need to put together to create some software support for your business opportunity. So that is frictionless distribution. A bank, some line of business and a bank sees an opportunity for a really cool uh, a new feature or new product. They want to whip up software to support it and they go for high quality open source software first because then they don't have to talk to the IT department. There's no purchasing process. Maybe they can run it on departmental servers, what have you. In any case, um, there will be users uh, who are not paying. And some of these users will not be consumer, end user, home users, but will be corporate users in companies. Now, as a smart vendor, commercial open source firm, you track your users. You're not obnoxiously calling them right after they downloaded the software to figure out whether you can sell them something, but rather you bid your time. Uh, so you're deliberate about it. Um, first of all, if you notice there are multiple users from the same organization, you offer to connect them. If they want to talk to each other, maybe you connect them and thereby strengthen your position inside that company. At some point of time, uh, you might go and ask whether, um, whether there's any interest in upgrading to a commercial version, those users in these companies. You're obviously not going to ask a home user, but if it's a big bank, uh, why not? So you can generate leads and key trigger is if they are busy, busy, for example, in forums, asking questions that they would not have if they were using the commercial version, for example. As you engage in a sales process, there are two ways, really. Um, one is you notice how many users there are, many instances of your software in that large potential customer company. So then you can proactively ask, don't you want to buy? Don't you want to consolidate? That's one way. Or the company, potential customer company themselves realize that uh, there's a need here and ask for that, ask for bids. So now you're competing with others. In both cases, there is always the question, does your software deliver what it promises? And of course, does it better so than any competitors? Now here is finally where all that groundwork kicks in that you uh, laid uh, with the open source strategy. You already know who's using your software in the customer or the potential customer organization. You know your people there. You can identify champions inside the target company and if you've treated them well and if your software is any good, they are likely to speak well of you. That is so strong when compared to another vendor who is just competing for the deal and who is otherwise more or less unknown to the buying organization. You already have people who will vouch for you because they know your software, have known it over a longer period of time. That is a very strong argument that maybe the company should go with your product because the risk is so much lower that something fundamental is wrong. So you make that sales call and this way you can comparatively easy, at least much easier than before, win in, a, in general and in a competitive sales situation. Well, so I already mentioned, if you observe your users and what they're doing and they see how they combine CRM software with business intelligence software, maybe the CRM software, the open commercial open source CRM software vendor and the commercial business intelligence software vendor should talk to each other uh, and establish a strategic co-selling partnership or so.
Product managers learn nicely, learn more about what's going on, what requirements there might be. It's very creative, it's very innovative what your users do and you should be tracking it. It's basically running user groups for free, focus groups for free. Software development find hears about bugs faster, may even be pointed to a solution uh, and so forth. Um, one of the misconceptions is that all the cost is in, in programming, which is not true. You've seen the uh, income statements of companies in this course before. Source code, according to Mikos, uh, Martin Mikos and others, is really the writing of code is just is maybe 10% of the effort. Uh, already finding bugs um, and identifying them is uh, equal amount of work. And if that your users do that for you for free, great. Um, many people like Googling more than calling up support. So if you have good forums, if your user community helps each other, um, then, then you already offload some of the support. Um, which brings me to the last point here. You have all these benefits. There is a cost which is open sourcing and then supporting the open source towards people who are not yet paying in order to make them think highly of you. That actually requires some sort of community management and touches on support, which you have to provide to some extent for free. So starting up incurs an initial investment cost that, uh, uh, and uh, community management cost, and that is real. And so you have to provide that investment. You can't do without it. But what you can do is if your community managers are smart, you, they will lead the community to help each other. Uh, people understand that if something's free, they can't uh, can't ask for free support or free operations in the cloud all the time. They can ask for some, but uh, they know they are not paying. They don't have a right to ask for support instantaneously and so forth. So smart community management deals with that, doesn't necessarily answer any support question right away themselves, but asks community members to help each other and supports that. The key here is to scale without having to scale up the number of community managers in the company. All right, and that's it uh, for today. Thank you very much for your time and attention. We talked about the key three business models uh, uh, that you can build on open source. And now in the final and the fourth part of this middle uh, part of fourth lecture of this middle part of the course, we will look at uh, cloud computing specifically because that is becoming or has become the dominant complement why customers buy and that requires its own strategies and that's where most of the action is these days. So see you then.